we developers are privileged to live in a remarkable time. Our computers are, are fast and relatively inexpensive. And we are more productive than ever before. I'm really glad that Greg told about Unity and Unreal, which are games engines. And they make us really productive. It's really easy to create a game in even a couple of hours. With Rails, we can create web applications in 15 minutes. So that's great. We are really productive. And for example, if I take my phone, which is like five years old, um, its processor is like 1,000, 1 gigahertz. It has plenty of memory. And it even connects with the freaking satellites. How cool is that? But there is one thing. Every time I've upgraded the software of that phone, it got slower. And I think that this tendency is prevalent in pretty much everything we do as developers. Because we, we don't need to optimize our software because it is fast enough. If we want to solve a problem that um, related with websites uh, loading slower, we can add additional computer, we can buy additional hardware, and it works. I don't want to say that, but I think we might have become lazy a bit. And we have lost something along the way. So my question is, what was the last time you, you've built something from scratch? How many of you work with like C Sharp, Ruby? Something else? JavaScript, maybe? OK. How many of you uh, did anything with C? OK, not that many of you. How many of you did something with assembly? OK, almost as with C. That's interesting. So uh, we don't have any opportunities to practice that. And I think that this is kind of important to, to learn to do something from like from scratch, from the bottom up. And the thing is with modern assemblies is that they are so, so complicated, it's not feasible, and it's not fun to work with them. Mm, it would be great if there would be a machine with a simple assembly that could allow us to do that as our hobby, to do that for, to, well, not to practice that during our work, because we don't need that during our work. But to practice those skills in our spare time, just to do something fun. So we have an Arduino, for example, which is pretty cool if you want to do something with electronics. But it doesn't work when you, when you want to create a game or something like that. You can use Raspberry Pi, but it is a modern computer. It runs on Linux, and it's not not much simpler than the computer that, we, that everybody uses. But the great thing is that the computer that allows us to practice those skills already exists. And its name is Commodore 64. And I want to convince you that you should learn to program this thing this year. How many of you know what Commodore is? Cool, almost everyone. So for those who don't, Commodore 64 is this beauty. And this is the highest selling computer model of all time. Still, it holds a Guinness World Record. Let me tell you some specs. They are pretty impressive. It's one megahertz CPU, so it's like 1,000 times slower than my phone. It's only 18 times slower than Arduino. And it has 64 kilobytes of RAM. So it's like 16 times more than everybody would ever need. Pretty cool. And it has 8-bit registers. Sadly, it's not produced for more than 20 years. And they are, there were around 70 games and 47 demos released in total last year. 
In fact, if you take a look at the statistics of games and demos released, you can see that it's kind of growing. And if you take a look at the statistic of things that people release, like not only games or demos, but uh, some graphics, some sounds, some small demos, some silly games, you count them in thousands. Lately, there were many successful crowdfunding campaigns. For example, this is a book that tells the story of a generation of Swedish developers, mostly our age, that started programming or started playing on Commodore 64 and became uh, really successful developers. Then there is a story of uh, different releases on, for Commodore 64. This one is another one. This one is really interesting. There is a guy in Texas who found the original molds for Commodore 64 cases and decided to create a Kickstarter to create new cases for Commodore 64. And it was a huge success. He made a lot of money on that. There is a lot of projects that uh, release new music or release remixes of music uh, for Commodore 64, like music for Commodore 64, or people who created music for Commodore 64 play concerts. This one happened a couple of months ago in Brighton, and all greatest stars that produced music on Commodore 64 were there. It was pretty amazing. I, unfortunately, I was, not, I was not able to be there, but I heard it was really great. So people love Commodore 64. I am one of them. Who am I? Uh, I am a founder of 64bytes.com. Uh, this is something that I will tell you about later. And I used to be a web and game developer. You can find me on Twitter as Mihauti. And the one thing that is important about me is that programming Commodore 64 is among the best computer-related hobbies. Well, it is the best computer-related hobby I've ever had. And this is how I started, with typing sim simple programs in BASIC. BASIC is a, a programming language that is available on Commodore 64 once you turn it on. Uh, so when I was smaller, I was typing like 10, print, hello, then 20, go to 10, then I typed run, and I saw a program that continuously printed the text on the screen, and I was like, mom, come on, come, come see that. And she was like, hmm, that's great, honey. Now come to the dinner. So, but I, I'm, I'm sure she was impressed by that. But this is why I stayed. So for a long time, I haven't had a chance to dig into the assembly of Commodore 64. And I always wanted to do that, because the demos and games that are produced and were produced on Commodore 64 are amazing. And it's like really, it's mind blowing what people can do with, within constraints of this computer. So usually, I do a live coding here. But I don't have that much time. Uh, but if you are interested, there, there is the stand with working Commodore 64. And I can show you some stuff on that. So after the talk, I invite you there. Let's talk about Commodore 64. It has plenty of graphical modes. First one is a normal character mode. It's called high resolution, because it's 320 by 200 pixels. Uh, there is 40 by 25 characters. Each one of them has one foreground color, and there is one common background color for all characters. And there are 256 characters to choose from. You, usually, you use it to write text or create applications like business ones, serious applications that you would use in a bank or to, for example, go to the moon. But you can also create games with it. And this is kind of interesting. So all of those graphics is built with characters. And you can see that uh, there are more colors that I said the, there would be possible. Because here you have two car colors per characters. But here you have different 
color of the background. And this is because it is one of many, uh, one of many useful hacks on Commodore 64 are, are being used here. Basically, when Commodore 64 generates graphics, uh, the pixel or the ray goes horizontally on the screen. And the graphical chip can tell you where actually the ray uh, on your TV is at the moment. So at this moment, it can run a small program and change the background. And here, it can change the background again. So this, this way, you can get more colors than would be normally possible. And it is used frequently in a lot of demos and a lot of games pretty much everywhere. But let's get, get back to the graphical modes. The other one is the multicolor character mode. You sacrifice the high resolution graphics because you have only 160 uh, pixels wide. So the pixels are basically wider on the screen. But you get three additional foreground colors. And with that, you can create graphics like this one. So all those platforms here are written by are, are drawn by characters. And you can see that there are like three or four colors in every one of them. So this is, this is how you draw a background in most games on Commodore 64. You use multicolor character mode. Then there is pretty weird extended background character mode, which uh, allows you to draw with a higher resolution, uh, but you have only 64 char characters to choose from, but you get additional background colors. And those are game, this is an exa example of a game that uses this character mode, and this is how it looks like. The interesting part about this game is that the first version of this game was designed for Flash. It was only designed to look like it was made on Commodore 64, but there is one person in the community of six Commodore 64 programmers that takes games that are produced on many different platforms and tries to port them onto Commodore 64. And this is like one-to-one -one port on Commodore 64 because it's like, it looks like it was made for Commodore 64. Then there is high resolution bitmap mode. When you don't draw with characters, but you draw with pixels, like with normal bitmap. But it's kind of weird, because Commodore 64 was produced quickly and cheaply, like the, well, not, not only the Commodore 64, but the graphical chip. And it reused some kind of logic related to drawing characters. So basically, you can think of bitmap mode as a 1,000 characters put on the screen memory. Uh, what it means in practice is that pixels are not ordered row by row, but row by row inside of the character, and the next character row by row, and so on. So this is pretty compl complicated, but using that, you can draw pictures like that. And if you use uh, previously mentioned hacks with, uh, with interrupts that show you when the, where the ray is, you can create images like this one. Then there is multicolor bitmap mode. And as with any multicolor modes, you sacrifice the resolution. So pixels are wider, but you get more colors. And you can draw pictures like this one, or this one. So those are, those are built-in Commodore 64 graphical modes. But the funny thing is, every year, Commodore 64 developers and designers uh, invent new graphical modes for Commodore 64. So basically, they uh, figure out hacks or figure out some different quirks of the machine and try to display more colors, uh, try to display, try to fake higher res resolution and things like that. So basically, every year, you get better pictures on Commodore 64. In the, at the same time, every year, my iPhone gets slower. Think about it. So you can get pictures like this one. If you take a closer look, and especially if you, if you watch it on the real uh, TV set or, or real 
Commodore, 60, Commodore 64 monitor, uh, you get effects like color bleeding, and it looks like it can display more than 16 colors. So this is another example. If you, if you would show that picture to someone 20 years ago, they would not believe it's on Commodore 64. So, as I said, it has pretty powerful CPU, so one megahertz, but it is not enough to fill the whole screen uh, on each frame. So, thanks to that, you have, uh, you have eight hardware sprites that are small movable bitmaps uh, that you can draw on the screen, that you can move around the screen, and it's rendered with uh, the graphical processor. And it was designed to create game, games, games like that. So those monsters, uh, this explosion, and the player are all sprites. And the rest of thing is characters. <clears throat> sprites, again, can be switched to a multicolor mode. And then, again, you sacrifice the resolution. And you can have sprites like that. So the character at the bottom is drawn with multicolor sprites. You can see the wider pixel, pixels, but you can see additional colors. And if you draw, that, draw graphics with sprites, you can quickly change the pointers to the un underlying bitmap, and you can create pretty good animation. Sound. This is also an interesting part, because Commodore 64 was revolu revolutionary, <laughs> revolutionary when it comes to sound. Basically, it, has, it had three voices that you could program uh, independently, and you could change uh, sound uh, shapes of the wave on each, uh, on each voice whenever you wanted. So this meant that uh, you could simulate more graphical, uh, more musical instruments uh, on this sound chip that was not possible before. Um, so I don't know that much about the sound on Commodore 64, so I'm sorry to, I cannot give you like really mind-blowing examples. But there is one interesting thing. There is a bug in volume setting, which can be used as a fourth sound or speech synthesis. Once again. Okay, so there are many different tricks that programmers and uh, designers use to do stuff on Commodore 64. There is spr sprite multiplexing. Uh, basically, Commodore 64 is supposed to allow you to draw only eight sprites. But uh, actual constraint is eight sprites on single horizontal line. If you draw eight sprites and go to, uh, to the bottom and switch Sorry. And uh, if you draw sprites, move them to, uh, to the bottom, then you can change the pointers of those sprites and you can display eight more. So this is pretty interesting. That should work. OK. You can open the borders. When you, uh, Commodore 64, was designed to be displayed on ordinary TV set. And there was no such thing like standard resolution for TVs. So uh, to get rid of the, of the fact that you would need to calibrate uh, the vision, Commodore 64 and a lot of other computers displayed a white border around the working area. And you were, were, you were not supposed to draw anything there. But surprise, surprise, uh, some clever hackers managed to open the border. They managed to do faster scrolling, which was not, well, they were not supposed to do that, and many different graphical effects uh, were possible thanks to that. So here is an example. So this thing here, this uh, monster, 
is drawn with sprite multi multiplexing. So it's, it is actually uh, many rows and columns of sprites uh, drawn on the screen using this technique of getting to know where exactly you are on the screen and then displaying the sprite at the appropriate position. Here you can see that the bonus and points uh, are drawn on the border. So this was also not supposed to be possible. Uh, when it comes to demos, uh, some things are taken to the extreme. Those things are sprites. There are around 150 of them. And it's probably current record that will be probably beaten in next year. So people are really creative when it comes to uh, programming things on the, in this constrained environment. So when I tell about modern demos, I don't even. Basically, keep in mind, watching those things, that Commodore 64, the processor, doesn't have the multiplication instruction. No, it doesn't have a graphic card. There is no OpenGL version for Commodore 64, but people still do something like this. Yeah, okay, that, that's boring. Let's add some shadows, maybe. And dynamic lightning. I don't even know where to start. I have no idea how this is made. <laughs> this one is interesting. One megahertz processor. No multiplication. The great thing is that you can learn all of that. But where's the catch? The thing is, the know-how know -how is out there. Basically, everything that uh, you can get, all the materials on the internet, but it's not that easy to access. You can read 20-year-old books, for example. That's, that can be pretty fun. I do that. Uh, but you might not have time to do that, basically. You can disassemble demos, which is really interesting, which can be hard, sometimes maybe impossible, but yeah, you can also do it, do it. You can browse forums, ask for help, but well. The community of uh, Commodore 64 developers is rather uniform. Mostly is uh, built with guys that either know everything about Commodore 64 or somebody who grew up with Commodore 64 and always wanted to do something with that. So basically, there are, there are many friendly people that, that want to share the knowledge, but some of them really want you to go with the same hard and uh, difficult path to learn what they know. And I want to change it. And this is why I started the 64 Bytes project. And the long-term goal, long goals of this project is to bring more people to the Commodore 64 community. And not only people who grew up with Commodore 64, but also those who know nothing about Commodore 64, nothing about retro computers. For example, who don't know that the, the, the processor of Commodore 64 was also used in, uh, in Apple II, NES, Atari, and probably a lot of other systems. So I want to make the community more accessible. So to gather around people with modern uh, approach to learning stuff, 
who don't want to uh, keep it to themselves like the Monsin, but want to share the knowledge and keep the Commodore 64 alive. Because when all the guys who know everything about Commodore 64 decide to not do that or mm, maybe pass away, that, that would be really bad for the community. So uh, I do quite a lot of things uh, related to, to this project. So one first of them is the series of screencasts I started doing. Uh, basically, I release a weekly video that teaches you a small part of Commodore 64. And each video is five minutes long, and this is by design. Because uh, we are busy, we don't have time to read all those books, and everybody has five, five minutes to learn something new. And in a couple of months, you could create a new game for Commodore 64. That would be great. So each video has exercises, the source code, and it is in inspired by Ruby Tapas by Avdi Green. Do you know what Ruby Tapas is, maybe? Ruby developers? Yeah, Ruby developers know. Uh, so yeah, you can watch free samples at 64bytes.com. And if you, uh, it is a paid subscription, so if you buy it today, you get 10% 10, 10 off with the TWF 2015 coupon code. Uh, yeah, so I also do talks uh, like this one and try to uh, let people know that Commodore 64 still lives, that there is a projects that, that gather around new community of people who want to learn it. And um, basically I want to uh, find people who would like to have a new pretty interesting hobby and do something that they never did before. So I also do workshops. I already uh, made two of them. There were more, uh, well, around 88 people attended both, both of them, and we managed to create one and a half game. The half of it is because we were too ambitious with the second, first workshop, but on the second one, we managed to create the whole game from scratch. So uh, I tried to release uh, stuff to the open source community. So I already released one library, which is 64 spec. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, if you program in Ruby, it is uh, highly inspired, uh, really inspired by, by RSpec. And basically it is test driven development framework for assembly for Commodore 64. It's already on Git GitHub. So uh, yeah, you can check it out. You can uh, send me pull request. That would be great. So I have a small favor uh, to ask for you. So basically, uh, I would be really happy to see people who never knew about Commodore 64 and to see them create a game or a demo. So if you don't mind, please tweet about this project and, or share it on Facebook or just tell your friends about them. Maybe some of them would be really happy to have a new hobby. To sum it up, we are privileged to live in a remarkable time because programming Commodore 64 is easier than ever before. And I want to challenge you to create a game or a demo this year. I want to invite you to join the community. Let's make it bigger and better together and let's keep old computers alive.